It's Friday night, Atlanta. Time to rise up tonight with Kelly Price and Harry Douglas. Presented by AT&T. Atlanta, how we doing? It's Friday night, and I'm Kelly Price, joined as always by former Falcons right receiver Harry Douglas. We've got the SEC championship game and Tom Brady coming to Mercedes-Benz this weekend. It's a pretty crazy weekend. Kelly, what a time to be alive and live here in Atlanta, Georgia. But I'm not going to let this day go by without wishing you a happy birthday. Uh. So happy <laughs> birthday to my dear Kelly, one of the best co-hosts in the world. You know what? The best co-host. Oh, wow. Wow. We're talking about the goat Tom Brady, and I guess I'm the goat of this show. The greatest all of all time. Okay. All right, I'll take it. Uh, well, we'll talk about some perspective here with Arthur Smith. He's always talking about perspective. He's always railing against hot takes, quote, narratives, and another perception his team dispelled this weekend that the Atlanta Falcons cannot run the ball. They did it this weekend. You may say, oh, that was against the Jaguars, but guess what? Jacksonville came into Sunday with the number three run defense in the league. Harry, you've got to respect the way they just kept believing in this run game. Did it drastically change anything and just chipped away at it until it got going? Yeah, that's one of the things that I I admire about Arthur Smith. Um, a lot of people gave him praise for that while he was an offensive coordinator in Tennessee. He actually stick, stuck with the run multiple times. Didn't matter if he went down 10 points, 14 points, 17 points. You want to stick to the script because you don't want to be one dimensional. If you're one dimensional, then the defense can pin their ears back, the defensive ends can get sacks, and you don't want Matt Ryan getting sacked. So shout out to Arthur Smith for sticking to the run. He did it against New Orleans too. Even though you didn't have that much success, he still got it done. And speaking of some progress, the defense showed it can do its thing again. In case you're not keeping track at home. The Falcons have allowed just two touchdowns in the last two games. Look it up. But you're lying if you said you weren't sweating out that final quarter as Jacksonville tried to rally. In the end, the Falcons closed out the game and the defense added some more confidence in their back pocket, right? I think this defense is finally getting what Dean Pease wants to do, Kelly. They're showing up. They got two turnovers in, in, in this game, an interception and a fumble. Not only that, they held the Jaguars to one for three in the red zone. That's huge. When you can just give up field goals and not give up touchdowns, that lets me know that you're bending, but you're not breaking. So shout out to this defense who's played well the last two weeks. Yeah. The win scooched the Falcons up to second place in the division behind the Bucks, who the Falcons will host this weekend at the Benz. As we mentioned, six games remain on the schedule. Let's be real. The Falcons haven't played meaningful football in December in quite some time. Matt Ryan and company talked after the game and this week about how exciting it is to still be in the hunt. And I'm curious, Harry, is that something that players actually focus on and actually pay attention to? Or you kind of get the same effort no matter what. Well, it depends on who the player is. If he's a real one, Kelly, he's going to play his heart out no <laughs> matter what. If he's a fake one, Kelly, he's going to fake the funk and not play his heart out every snap. But I will say the Falcons right now, they're in eighth place, right? When you talk about the wild card, there are two teams ahead of them right now. Uh, luckily, they get a chance to play one of those teams. Um, they lost to the Washington football team, so that loss is going to hurt. It can't hurt down the end, but to be playing men meaningful games in December, it's what you ask for, it's what you want. So shout out to those players for giving their all each week. And now is when you find out about those pretenders. Well, while things have been frigid as the calendar hits December here in Atlanta. The Dirty Birds flew south this week into Jacksonville. Despite being in Florida, they packed the same winter fashion vibes in their carry-ons, though. They always slay it, though. Here are the best Falcons fits from Sunday. First up, the Rook, Richie Grant, looking like Little Red Riding Hood or something. What's going on with the kerchief? He's looking like someone's grandma with that on his head. No cap, I do not hate the look, but I just thought that was kind of funny. I don't know what Richie Grant has going on here, <laughs> Kelly, but uh, somebody <laughs> need to give him some notes. I don't know. Little House on the Prairie, Little Red Riding Hood. I don't know. The Golden Girls. I don't know. Richie, I don't know. D do something with it, man. <laughs> and the O-line had a nice little day on Sunday. We had to know it was coming when we saw this look from Mr. Jalen Mayfield. The left guard cleans up nice. The checker suit. Would have liked to see him go full fancy with some nice dress shoes, but for his first Falcons Fitz appearance, not too shabby. This made me laugh because it, it made me it remember, it made me think about one of my old teammates, Sam Baker, right? Sam Baker used to wear one suit every time we travel, one suit. And Kelly, that one suit was so baggy and shaggy. <laughs> I used to be like, Sam, you gotta tailor that thing up a little bit, man. You was a first round draft pick, but shout out to Jalen Mayfield. Actually not wearing a hoodie and wearing a suit. <laughs> You're getting it, my man. You're getting it. He looks like he's got a good tailor there. Well, some rookies to some rookies to the vet. Mike Davis absolutely loved the shirt jacket here. He's got the ice um, up top with his number. It's a fall vibe for sure. I like how casual he kept it even down to those Nikes. Well, I know who don't miss leg day. It's Mike <laughs> Davis because his thighs 
His thighs are about to bust out of those <laughs> jeans. You talk about skinny. Mike Davis can't even wear skinny jeans. They might be skinny jeans, but shout out to Mike, man, representing that's that West Coast look. You got the plaid shirt with the white shirt underneath. Got it opened up a little bit. Do your thing, Mike. Love it. And at this point, we need to just keep a permanent spot in the rotation here for Grady Jarrett. The man does not miss. He told me last summer that he plans all of his outfits in the offseason for the whole entire season. And you can tell the preparation is key here. Listen, he has the Gucci. He has the red bottoms. I can't tell uh, what, what, what kind of red bag that is, but I'm pretty sure it costs over $5,000. <laughs> Shout out to Mr. Grady Jarrett for getting the outfits ready in the offseason. We know how he does it. It is about that time. Thanksgiving has passed and the holiday decor is starting to go up around town. The Christmas lists are being made. So we asked some of the guys what they want for Christmas in this week's question of the week. Yeah, I would love just like a, a Mercedes or something. Just a car. That would be a, a, the perfect uh, Christmas gift. Uh, a house. Somebody wants to give me that. <laughs> oh, man, I want that g -Wagon. That's on my, my Christmas list. Hopefully that gets to me for free. If I had to pay for it, it would not be on my Christmas list. <laughs> Probably a win. Whatever week we're like, if we had just played or the next week, a win. That, that's what we need for Christmas. I like where Josh's head is at there. What about you? What's on your Christmas list? Mickey Mouse underwear, like my son Kelly. All right, there you go. <laughs> We'll still head here on Rise Up tonight as the Falcons celebrate the 30th anniversary of their 1991 team. We caught up with the quarterback from that rudest team. Chris Miller will stop by later in the show. Plus, I break down how an unexpected D lineman made a big impact on Sunday in versus Jacksonville. My film room is next on Rise Up tonight. We got you covered with more Falcons news and nuggets, including a trip over to Harry's film room. Rise Up tonight will be right back. What's up, ATL? This is Head Crack. Let's rejoin my favorite co hosts Kelly and Harry, for more Rise Up tonight on your home for Falcons football, Fox 5 Atlanta. Welcome back to Rise Up tonight for this week's edition of Harry's Film Room. Now, when you talk about the word trust in the game of football, it can go a lot of different directions. Being an undrafted free agent, let's just say you have to gain the trust faster from your coaches and your teammates. Nose tackle Anthony Rush has done that. Let's take a look at his impact this past Sunday against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, Anthony Rush right here, nose tackle. This young man is playing a good brand of football. He's hungry, he's physical, and he wants to make an impact. As we let this play play out, we're gonna see a couple things here. We're gonna stop it right here. First things first, he got contacted by the guard. Second thing, he got contacted by the offensive tackle. But as we let the play play out, we're going to see it from the back end as well. Put the nose on the football, but I want y'all to see the back angle. It doesn't matter that he got hit by the tackle in the guard. He knows he has to make that play. And not only did he make the tackle, he caused that football to come out. Now that's what I'm talking about, taking advantage of your opportunities. This guy's an undrafted free agent, making plays week in and week out. See that Rydell right on the football? Making plays week in and week out for his football team. That's what I call Johnny on the spot, a guy being ready. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Kelly, back to you. Thanks, Harry. You could say Anthony Rush puts the rush in pass rush. See what I did there? As for this week against Tampa, winning the turnover battle as well as limiting and creating explosive plays will be key for the Falcons. Falcons insider Dave Archer breaks down that and more in his keys to the game. Falcons come over after a big win down in Jacksonville, and here comes a Florida team up this way. It's Tampa Bay. It's your division rival right here at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Let's look at the keys to the game. It's a Tampa Bay defense that feeds on taking the football away. 23 takeaways is fourth in the league. If you look at their record, 8-3, and three, their three losses, they lost the giveaway-takeaway ratio. And that's normally the case, but this is a team that creates mass amounts of turnovers. They want to turn you over the football and defend the run. Now, they haven't defended the run so well over the last five games. You go back early in the year, they were outstanding. 47 yards per game on the ground in the first five. The last five, it's been a different story. Teams have run it to the tune of about 112 yards a game, including last weekend, Indianapolis Rang him up for 107 yards on the ground. There's where Atlanta can get a little footing. Get that run game cranked up like you had it cranked up last week and take care of the football. I think you get this thing into the fourth quarter with an opportunity to win. On the other side of the ball, 
their offense is about big plays, explosive plays, 15 yards or more. They have 87 on the year. That's almost 30 more than the Atlanta Falcons have. Must limit the explosive play. Leonard Fournette has been the catalyst a little bit, running the football and catching it out of the backfield. He's been there. Cordero Patterson, if you will. He had 100 yards rushing and three touchdowns this last weekend. Take care of him, but no big plays. And I think we'll like the results right here at home. All right, thanks, Arch. Still to come here on Rise Up tonight, hear from the artist behind the My Cause, My Cleats campaign for many Falcons players. That story coming up later in the show. And coming up next, we're going to Nets with Chris Miller. Don't miss that on Rise Up Tonight. Rise Up Tonight is presented by AT&T and brought to you by Georgia Lottery. Today could be the day. By Home Depot, how doers get more done. By Mercedes-Benz, the best of nothing, and by Truist, committed to a better future. Welcome back to Rise Up Tonight, and it's time to hop into the nest with Kelly, Harry, and tonight's influencer, brought to you by Mercedes-Benz. In the nest with us today is Chris Miller, former Falcons quarterback who had one of his best seasons back in that 91 season, over 3,000 yards, 26 touchdowns. They've been celebrating this 1991 team with the 30th anniversary coming up. How would you describe that team and what kind of made that team what it was? I tell you what, it was just a fun-loving group and it was kind of spearheaded by our head coach, Jerry Glanville. You know, he's a crazy guy. He's a... Uh, we did a little video shoot probably three, four weeks ago, and he's 80 years old now, but it's like he's 25. I mean, he's 25 or 30, and there's something about football that just keeps you young, and he personifies that. So uh, I think that team, you know, Jerry just encouraged us to be our, our own selves, you know, to let our personality shine through. And, and uh, you know, it was all kind of led by his jovial, outgoing, crazy, you know, back in black, uh, driving Harleys, leaving tickets for James Dean, uh, Elvis, the whole deal. And we just all kind of piggybacked off of that. But we had a lot of talent. We had a lot of uh, a lot of fun, a lot of good players. They had put together a pretty good team by that point in time. Jerry had been there a couple of years and they, Kenny Herrock, our general manager. You know, we had some good personnel too. So not only did we play well, but we had a great time. We had a lot of fanfare with us, a lot of celebs. And it just made it for a really cool, fun year for all of us. Now, who, who was the mean slash nastiest player on the 1991 Falcons team? Well, you know, Jesse the Hammer Tuggle, our middle linebacker, was a beast. You know, I saw him a couple weeks ago when I was back in Atlanta. I, I, I looked at him, and I'm 6'2", 212, 215. I looked at him, and he's like 5'11", 230. I'm like, dang, dude, how do you play for 14, 15 years <laughs> in, the, in that pressure cooker, in that box in there, you know, amongst all those big guys? What memories do you have playing with that team and kind of having the whole city of Atlanta really rallying behind you? I got a lot of great memories from that team. I think that's the one thing we carry as former players is those memories and those relationships. I think the, the fondest thing are the memories and, and and probably just the journey that we, we took, you know, from the preseason concert where we had uh, Doug Stone and Travis Tritt and Jerry Jeff Walker and, uh, you know, a bunch of, uh, uh, oh gosh, Chris Christopherson. And so that kind of kicked off the season, you know, then we got going we struggled a little bit out of the gate. I think we were one and two, and but then we got rolling and playing well went six and one, I think our last seven and, and ended up winning the NFC West and and then going into the playoffs, you know, we had our first playoff win in 11 seasons there. And when I got to Atlanta, there was only, they only had three winning seasons in 23 years. So that program, that, that organization really struggled. So it was kind of nice to be that group to go to New Orleans and beat the Saints in the playoffs. And then we lost the following week to the eventual Super Bowl champions. But a lot of great memories, a lot of great dudes, just a lot of great guys we had fun with, you know, after games, before games, uh, during in the offseason playing in golf tournaments and I love the city of Atlanta the people who were there were genuine uh, you know I think we kind of introduced culture uh, hip hop with with uh, MC Hammer and Too Legit to Quit and so football and, and entertainment kind of crossed paths and that made it really uh, extra special. Do you still stay around the game with coaching and you mentioned your team being in the playoffs up in uh, yeah. Oregon right now what is it that you love about that part of the game being able to coach players? Well I think what I mentioned you know regarding Jerry Glanville it keeps us young you know I'm hanging out with 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds now. And, and uh, they're, they're just genuine, you know, they're authentic, they're genuine. It's such a social media craze now. They keep you on your toes with all that stuff. And so, you know, we'll practice today. We're actually going down to the stadium. We're in the state semifinals, so we're in the final four. So we'll go down to that stadium that we're playing in for the, the semis and go practice today and take a bus ride out there. And, 
you know, and, and probably the competition is big too. You know, as I'm 56 years old now, there's not a whole lot of competitive things that I'm able to do. So, so you know, I got all my I got all my papers on the table here, my game plans, my whiteboard <laughs> over there. You know, during the week, uh, during the week, I game plan. I kind of come up with my my play, my uh, game plan and ideas against the team we're going to play. Then go out and kind of work with the kids during the week in practice. So it keeps me young. I got a great coaching staff, former NFL players on my staff, Alex Molden and Anthony Newman, who are also Oregon Ducks, got a great staff. So it's just an enjoyable, enjoyable sport to be around. It's a lifetime sport. And really, football personifies life, especially with what we're dealing with now with COVID and the challenges we have going on in our country. I think life, uh, we really learn a lot through the eyes of football. So we're able to kind of pass that along to, to the kids we coach. Yeah, very well said. Well, good luck the rest of the way in these high school football playoffs. What an exciting time for that. Chris Miller, thanks for joining us. For anyone who wants to catch the full conversation, head to fox5atlanta.com. We'll be right back on Rise Up tonight. Hey, Atlanta, this is Head Crack talking, and you're watching Rise Up Tonight, presented by AT&T. Hey, Crack here. Rise Up Tonight has been presented to you by AT&T. Every year, NFL players lace up their cleats for their causes near and dear to their heart. For many Atlanta Falcons, a local artist takes pride in crafting those very cleats. Victor Prieto has that story as we rise up for Atlanta, brought to you by Truist. What people wear tells you a lot about them. I think um, you're, you're able to express yourself a lot more through art and forms of art. Art takes many forms. Whether it be on the walls in museums or the lyrics in a song, it's notable. For Curtis Booth, his art comes alive on an unusual canvas, a cleat. For one, it's not something everyone can do. Um, and it's something that you can just get real creative with. You know, there's no limit to creativity at all. So I look at it like this, I tattoo shoes. Graduating with a degree in forensic psychology, Curtis began painting shoes in 2013 out of boredom. The self-taught artist made his break customizing shoes for the likes of Justin Hardy, Julio Jones, Cordero Patterson, and many others. Looks like a popsicle. <laughs> After leaving his day job to pursue art full-time, uh, yeah. Curtis has become the official cleat designer of the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, I look at it like, man, this is like, you have to be a magician when it comes to this, you know? It's like magic for real. <laughs> With the NFL's annual My Cause, My Cleats, Curtis was commissioned to paint all 42 shoes for this year's roster, giving each player an opportunity to showcase a charity or cause close to their hearts. Running back Cordero Patterson will wear cleats supporting pregnancy and infant loss awareness after him and his girlfriend experienced the loss of a baby five years ago. This hit home for me and my family, you know, because me and my girl, we, we dealt with this already, you know, so it's, it's, it's a big, big part of our life, you know, and every day go by, you know, we, we think about stuff like this, so, you know, just to, to put it on the cleats, you know, and be in our heart, you know, it's just, it's just awesome, man. On Sunday, each player will be playing for their own cause. Matt Ryan will be repping the At Promise Center, while other players like Deron Harmon will play for Autism Speaks. Behind them all, though, is one person whose work has turned plain canvases into a work of art. For Fox 5 Sports, I'm Victor Prieto. <laughs> Very cool story. I love to see all their different causes. Well, we heard Dave Archer talk about explosive plays in his keys to the game earlier. That's a tough task against this Tampa Bay receiving core. What can the Falcons do on defense to disrupt the Bucks' ultra productive offense with so many weapons, Harry? Well, Kelly, they have to contain Grunk. That's his, that's his security blanket. Um, Tom Brady, he loves Grunk. He followed him down to Tampa Bay uh, after being retired. So you got to contain Grunk and those weapons. In the first matchup, the man coverage is what really killed this Atlanta Falcons defense. So hopefully they can play tighter man coverage and, and get some PBUs as pass, pass breakups and some turnovers. We need some turnovers. Yeah, got to limit Leonard Fournette, too. He has been excellent on the ground for them. Well, thank you all for staying up late with us here on Rise Up tonight. We'll see you right back here next Friday night, Atlanta. <laughs>